Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the post-secondary information presentation. Uh, we're happy that you were able to join us today. Uh, we are going to start today's presentation uh, with our uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, so for parents, uh, this is something that we share every morning uh, with students and with staff. Uh, so we begin today's uh, post-secondary information workshop by acknowledging that we are situated on the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. For thousands of years, Indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and Chippewa people, Adirondack, the land that is home to Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississauga of the Credit. We do the land acknowledgement as a way to offer recognition and respect as treaty people. We do it to repair our relationship with Indigenous communities and with the land, to acknowledge ongoing settler colonialism, broken treaties, and the continued occupation of Indigenous lands. We're going to start today's presentation by making a few introductions. First up, we have uh, Mr. Omar Zia, who is our acting principal. Good evening, parents and students. It's my pleasure to be with all of you here tonight, and thank you for joining us here. We have over 100 people attending, which is a great turnout, and we hope more people join us as well. The journey of post-secondary can never start early enough, and it's also one that sometimes comes with a little bit of anxiety and concern about where are we going to go, but planning is the key, right? Those who take the time to plan will be, will be the ones who are successful. So thank you again for joining us here. And starting that planning journey, we encourage all of our parents to listen as much as close as possible, to come up with some questions so we can take up those questions, and also feel free to reach out to your child's guidance counselor even after this presentation is finished to have more questions answered as well. We also encourage that beyond this beyond this presentation tonight, to also take time to learn more about the variety of programs that are available across the province and all of our <laughs> colleges. There's so many pathways and so many programs that are open within the college pathway itself. As a former guidance counselor, I'd like to extend a welcome to all of you to ensure that you look at all of the websites that are available that support parents and students as they make these very important decisions. And to know that the decisions never end and that even after our kids graduate from high school and from college, that there are still decisions to be made beyond in the, in the realm of employment as well. I'll stop speaking at this time and allow the presentation to begin. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Effie Lagudis, who is our guidance counselor, Alpha E through M. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. We are very excited to work with you and share some information and take your questions. Enjoy. And I am Lindsay Orr. I am Head of Student Services and Pathway Planning here at the Woodland School. Uh, I am going to uh, be helping with uh, making this presentation along with Ms. Lagudis and also monitoring some of those questions. Uh, so with that, we are going to move along to the agenda from so from 6 to 6.30, we're going to look at college applications. From 6.30 to 6.45, we'll answer your questions. And then from 6.45 to 7.15, we'll move on to university applications. 7.15 to 7.30, we will um, review those questions. Um, by 7.30, uh, if we've not answered your question, we will be posting a Google form in the chat so that you, if you have specific questions or if you have questions that we just didn't address um, for time, a guidance counselor will contact you with those answers. We're also going to be posting a recording of this presentation to the student, student services site, as well as the grad Google Classroom, okay? So graduation requirements is one of the most important things that you're obviously going to be concerned about before you apply. So these are conversations that you can have with your guidance counselor at any time. So by the end of June, you know that you need to have 30 credits, uh, 18 compulsory credits, and 12 optional credits. You're also going to want to make sure that you've completed your three additional categories. So what that means is that there are three additional tiers of categories that you need to fit in order to fulfill those 30 credits. If you're not sure if you've done that, 
please make sure that you've contacted your guidance counselor and we can send you a status sheet that will show you if you've actually been successful in that. Uh, SHSM requirements. If you are in SHSM, please make sure that you have contacted your SHSM teacher lead to make sure that you have been signed up for those requirements uh, and making sure that everything is going to be complete before the end of June. OSSLT, just to be clear, you do not have to do the OSSLT this year to graduate. Uh, we haven't done it now for, this will be the third year for the grade 12s. So it's not a requirement that you have to do, nor do you have to do the OLC course. Volunteer hours, however, you do need to do, you have to complete 20 of them. Uh, and again, in this presentation and on the student services um, site, there is information about community service information and community service opportunities that we post as they become available. You do not need to have your community hours done in order to submit your application. Okay, so I want that to be really, really clear. Um, if you are applying to college, university, apprenticeships, um, if you're applying to outside of Ontario, it doesn't matter. You don't need to complete your volunteer hours in order to apply. Please apply as soon as possible, as soon as you're ready and you're good to go. But let's talk about these community service criteria because as guidance counselors, we are held to a really strict level of granting those community service hours. And so we really wanna make sure that we're going over what is eligible and what is ineligible. This information is posted onto the student services site and we're also gonna go through some examples. So eligible activities that you wanna aim for are things that are not for profit, um, institutions or foundations, but again, it's all volunteering, but for events, okay? And I'm gonna get into why that's really important in a second. You wanna look at structured programs to promote tutoring, mentoring, visiting, and coaching. So for tutoring or mentoring, you could even do something within the school. Uh, we have the peer tutoring program that's run out of student services. You can join and get your hours that way. Visiting, you can visit hospitals, you can visit old age homes, you can visit community centers, um, sitting with youth or elderly and, and have those visiting sessions. You just need someone who's a, not a family member to sign off on those. And then coaching. But coaching, again, remember, it can't be for profit. It has to be not for profit. So something within like a YMCA would be okay, but something for a private um, dance studio or something that's gonna be make a profit, winter's coming, so it could be skiing, skating, snowboarding, um, anything that's for profit is not gonna count, okay? You should be getting paid. <laughs> uh, anything that promotes environmental awareness uh, is always gonna be really good. Uh, if For those of you who have been or want to be involved in Duke of Ed, they have some great environmental awareness volunteering opportunities. Uh, something that promotes and contributes to the health and well-being of any group. So again, even within the school, we have uh, some mental health and wellness workshops, clubs that you can team up with, and the work that you do within those clubs helps. Affiliated with a club, religious organization, arts, cultural association, or political organization with the goal of making a positive contribution to the community. It's a mouthful, but it's really important. So any kind of food bank, any kind of church group, any kind of community um, a celebration. So uh, over the summer, I know a lot of you were involved in cultural celebrations. Um, even political campaigns can count as well. So again, when in doubt, email your guidance counselor. Some of the things that I we have always been bumping into with students in um, submitting their hours and something I want to talk to you about now is so activities that displace paid workers. There are some of you that submit hours that are really concerning because they should be for paid workers or you should be getting paid for them. So please make sure that if you are doing the work of someone who could be getting paid to do that work or used to be paid to do that work, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're checking with that employer and you're checking with your guidance counselor because it's not gonna qualify. An example of that could be if you're doing administrative duties at a doctor's office or a dental office. Um, that kind of work is something that someone should be getting paid to do and you're gonna wanna follow up with that. Um, again, any activity that normally requires pay, so babysitting, you cannot volunteer to babysit. Okay, um, again, you should be getting paid for that. Any activity that is not subsidized. So what that means is if you're going to a camp as a leader and that camp offers subsidizing for um, low income families, and so they rely on volunteers in order to allow for that subsidizing, 
then it's an eligible activity. It counts. If they don't offer subsidizing and they are for profit, then it is not eligible. Okay. Take your kid to work experience. Anything that requires a credit to, or a student to earn a credit that is not volunteering for community service. Um, any activity that is family responsibilities. This one's tricky because this is the pandemic. There are two exceptions to this rule. You can get up to 10 hours for family responsibilities right now. So that's chores that you have around the house. That could be things that you're doing with your younger siblings. That could be ways in which you're helping your family. And all you have to do is you declare those 10 hours, but there's reflection questions that you have to do and your guidance counselor can give those to you. The other one is you can earn up to 10 hours of community service for paid work. So if you already have a job, same thing, you can earn 10 hours, fill out your reflection questions, and you're good. And if you do those both 10 hours, there's your 20 hours right there. Any court ordered community service isn't gonna count. Uh, any activity that provides uh, direct financial revenue for the company that you are volunteering for is not gonna count. And any organization or activity that does not comply with the policies of the ministry, the Appeal Board of Education or human rights legislation, those are not gonna count. When in doubt, email your guidance counselor. Here are some examples that we've said will count and you can take a look at these. So volunteering at a community food bank, uh, being a camp leader for a not-for-profit, uh, assisting schools with events and charity. So anything that we have going on within the school, depending if it's a school-wide event, you can sometimes get hours for those. So make sure you're talking to your classroom teachers. As I said, the peer mentoring tutoring program that we have in student services, that counts if you're you know, visiting an animal shelter or working in a lot or volunteering at a retirement home, long-term care facility, hospital and the like, all of that counts. If you hold a leadership position within a club or organization, even if that organization is not for profit, it does not count. Why? Because, so let's say you are the president of your club team organization. That is something that you have taken on and it's not going to qualify, okay? Yes, it's volunteering and it's great work. I'm not discounting that, but you are wanting to really make sure that it's the event that you're helping to plan, not the planning that is actually happening. That is something that you have chosen to take on that is something that is great leadership experience. It's gonna look great on your resume. It's gonna be great experience you can draw on when you're doing your interviews, but it is not actually community service. Now, let's say in your executive role, you planned an event, okay? And it's for the community, it's for students. You can get hours on the day of for that event, but not for the executive position you held while you were planning it. Okay, again, when in doubt, email your guidance counselor. Um, volunteering at a company organization where you assist with administrative tasks, those are almost always not applicable for your community hours. So you're gonna wanna make sure uh, to uh, double check everything. If you're volunteering as an instructor in a dance studio, ski club, as I said before, it's not gonna count. Same thing goes. So just like before where I said, if you were tutoring at a peer mentoring tutoring, um, within the school or even within the community. So let's say you are at a shelter, okay? And there's youth there that really need help with tutoring. That counts. But if you're volunteering at something like Spirit Math or Oxford, Sylvan, Kumon, that's not gonna, that's not gonna count, okay? Because that is a for-profit organization. And again, there are paid teachers that are part of that organization to do a lot of that work. So you wanna really make sure that you are helping the community not necessarily just volunteering, okay? Everything is volunteering, but not all volunteering is community service. So now we're actually gonna get into how you apply uh, to American University, or sorry, not American Universities, sorry. We are in Ontario colleges. Uh, so college is great. It is a flexible program. It's economical, it's innovative, it's supportive. And I can't say enough about a lot of these college programs. They're fantastic. So one, not only are they a lot cheaper than uh, university programs, they're also a lot more practical, a lot more flexible, um, and very supportive to your learning needs. So Ontario college programs offer a lot of advantages for students, um, especially if you haven't really 100% figured out, you know, where you want to work or where within that field you want to go. So reasons to attend college, as I said, so innovative and groundbreaking programs. For a lot of years, college programs were far more practical, 
But in the last 10 years, they have received huge government grants uh, to become far more innovative, groundbreaking in their programming. Um, they've got great flight schools, great engineering programs, great uh, animation programs. And so sometimes they actually get overlooked when really what you think you're going to university for, you could be going to college for and come out of it with a co-op and a placement and a potential job. They are very explorer friendly. I'm gonna show you part of the website uh, that you can go to for college. Uh, there really is something for everyone in these. You can, <laughs> I do like the choose your own adventure title uh, because you really do get to explore and, and dig right into what it is you're really interested about without having to take courses that just fit the program, but more that you are taking things that fit you. Um, it's also never too late to apply to these. College, ben uh, the, co the benefit of college is that they do rolling um, enrollment for their college programs. So you can keep applying to things as there is room available within those colleges. Real world experience before you graduate, most if not all programs, in college involve some sort of placement or some sort of co-op, which is fantastic. So you're connected to employers before you even begin. Uh, and then you've got, uh, so classrooms that connect you, again, they're not as big, those classes. Um, and so you're not sitting in a lecture hall with five or six or 700 people. They are smaller programs so that you are deal you are working with people on a far more one-on-one -on -one basis or one on 20, one on 50, it's smaller. And then locations, there's tons of locations um, for you to be able to do. This is a video, but again, once we download that presentation, you can check the video um, out and the various videos that are linked to the website as well. So really important dates are what you're gonna wanna focus on for college uh, applications. So it is flexible, yes, but there are still some deadlines and due dates that you wanna pay attention to. So early October, that's when things open for college applications. By November 1st, that's the earliest date that you really want, that you would start to see offers come from college. Now you are not at a disadvantage if you have not applied to a college program before November 1st. As I said, they do rolling enrollment and offers. So if you apply at the end of October, or if you apply in December or January, you're still fine because they don't fill the programs until that deadline. Then February 1st is the deadline that you really wanna pay close attention to. So that's the deadline for applying to highly competitive programs, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. It's the application to receive and pay for um, the, your actual application that you've submitted. It's also the early uh, equal consideration date. So any application that is submitted before February 1st will be treated equally when all of the colleges are reviewing everything. After February 1st, if you are applying, you go to the bottom of the list, okay? So everyone is in one pool for February 1st, and then anyone who applies after February 1st, they would go through all of the equal consideration people first, and then if they still have room in those programs, that's when they start filling in from that list. And then you can start accepting those offers when you get them. And then you have the May 1st, so most common deadline to confirm your offer. And then June 1st is the earliest that you would require payment for tuition. So make sure that you are exploring that as well. Uh, so College Mondays, being as normally in a normal school year, we would actually take a group of students to the college fair in Toronto, COVID being what it is. Colleges have actually um, moved to a virtual platform and this year they're trying College Mondays. So that means every Monday uh, until the end of November, they have four panels that you can register to discuss and those same colleges come in and do a presentation throughout. So those panels look like this. So if you wanna talk to any of these colleges or you wanna see their presentations, the dates are on the side here. So every Monday from you know four to five, six to seven, you can see these panels and you can go to the link that's on this presentation or write, if you just Google College Mondays, you're going to see the dates that you can sign up for and what panels it is that you wanna see. So let's say you really wanted to know more about Humber, then the next Monday that's coming, so October 25th, you would say, okay, I'm gonna sign up for panel number one, and then November 1st, I'm gonna do panel number two, November 8th, panel number three, November 15th, panel number four. And then you'll get to see what each of those colleges has to offer and what, some of, what are some of their requirements. 
Okay, for skilled trade programs and careers in the trades, colleges have many skilled trade programs to choose from. Apprenticeship is post-secondary education, and we think it is very worthwhile for you to explore your careers uh, related to trade. So what an apprenticeship would include would be a combination of hands-on work at a work site with an employer and classroom instruction at a college. A couple of popular examples are automotive service technician, electrician, baker, plumber, refrigeration and air, condition, air conditioning systems mechanic, and cook. Um, okay, and next slide, please. Uh, choosing a college, uh, almost 30 different colleges in Ontario. Here are some you've probably heard of, at least some of the local ones, but there are a number to explore. Um, and depending on where in Ontario you're thinking, or perhaps you're thinking of staying local, there's a lot here that you can research. Um, next slide, please. Exploring your selected colleges. Some of the different features you can use to search or explore, um, contacting information, contact info, so that'll give you more information on campus locations and contact info, uh, selecting more if you need to get more information about the college or programs or student life, or you can search through all the programs offered by a particular college. So if you perhaps know you'd like, you really want to go to one college, you're not really looking to explore many different ones, so you know for sure you want to go there, you might want to use this tool so you can see what else might be available there. Thank you. Um, finding a program. So if you're not sure where to start, you can begin by searching available programs in these categories. So sometimes you, you know, you might find an idea you hadn't thought of before. You might not have known all of the things that are available to you. So we recommend taking some time to research and knowing your options. Okay, and highly competitive programs at Ontario Colleges, and Ms. Orr mentioned uh, about this a little bit. So there are a number of programs that are considered highly competitive. So that means that there are going to be a lot more applicants than there are spaces available. And the deadline to be considered for these programs, um, Ms. Orr, I think you also mentioned this, uh, is always February 1st. That's the equal consideration date. So a lot of times people uh, know that college for college you can apply even later, but if you are applying to a highly competitive program, it is best to do so by February 1st, because if you do so after, uh, you are going to be, again, it's going to be first come, first serve, and the chances are it's going to be full. Um, so the applicants are accepted in the order of first priority would go to permanent residents of Ontario, and then um, applicants who are coming from other provinces or territories, and then finally applicants from other countries. So um, if you're not sure if your program is highly competitive, we suggest you just check that out under find a program. Uh, credit transfer between colleges and universities. So if you have already, uh, once you're in college, if you do complete some um, some courses at one college, but you're thinking of moving to a different college or you've changed your mind, uh, it is possible for you to get credit for some of the programs, or perhaps even all of the credits that you've done. Um, there is a website at the bottom of this slide here where we suggest checking it out if this is going to apply to you. You might not know yet because you're not in yet. Um, and another important link at the very bottom there called you'll see collaborative programs. Collaborative programs are programs that combine some education of college and, and some with university. So a lot of students are sometimes stuck on whether they should apply to college, university, both. And we do recommend checking these out because there are a number that will have two years at college and then followed by two years at university. A lot of times these are for degree programs, so you, you still have to have the prerequisites that you would need if you were attending a university for a degree program. So if you click on that bottom link, it'll take you to all of the university and college partnerships that offer these collaborative programs, and they're definitely worthwhile exploring. Okay, and so your application. So once you've completed all your research, you're ready to begin your application. And, and uh, OntarioColleges.ca, it all starts there. They are quite good at breaking it down and making it quite simple and streamlined. So Canadian applicants, you would just begin, apply now. Um, and then here's some information about your application. So it does cost $95, it's not refundable. Um, an application for $95 allows you to apply to up to five program choices, but no more than three at one college. All program uh, choices that you choose with one application have to start in the same academic year. So there are some, some programs that will begin mid-year, and we can check those out if you have a specific question about that. Um, or please remember your username when you're creating your account is permanent. Um, it does not change, and when you create your password, it must be between 8 and 14 characters in length. Okay, um, other important info, so please do not create more than one account. 
You cannot make changes to your first name, your last name, your birthday, your OEN. Your OEN is your Ontario education number, nine digit number. Um, if there are, is some information that you're not sure about, you can contact ontariocolleges.ca. Um, if you've checked over and there might be a problem with your grades or you feel like something's missing, please see your guidance counselor. Um, and then a little bit more information on this slide about the, uh, the best browsers to use for your online application. Uh, and other important information, so for your email address, please make sure you have a valid and appropriate email address because Ontario Colleges is going to communicate with you using email. Um, so that is what you're going to be checking. If you make changes to your email, please make sure to update your file, your, your um, profile. And please make sure to check your email regularly. Check the, the junk in the spam folder to make sure um, that you haven't missed anything and make sure to add the no reply at Ontario Colleges to your safe centers because they'll be communicating with you. Okay, um, so your account with Ontario Colleges, your account allows you to apply to any of the colleges. It, you can, once you have this account, you can go in and review and update. You can request transcripts. You will not, uh, if you're a current student, you will not really need to request transcripts because the school is going to send your marks automatically. Um, and this is where you also view and you accept your offers of admission. So to complete your application, uh, you will need to make sure you have your complete mailing address, your postal code, your OEN, as we said. If you're not sure where to find your OEN, you can find it on your report card and on your transcript. Okay, sending marks in. We just mentioned that, yes, we will send your marks um, automatically. Please make sure that once your marks are sent that you are checking to make sure. Sometimes a mistake could be made or a technical error. Make sure that all the marks you've completed are there and they're correct. Um, especially if you've taken a credit uh, outside of day school, if it's something that is not one of your regular day courses. Um, Next slide here is, yeah, there's a video here. We won't go through the video right now, but it, it really breaks it down and helps you um, go through all the steps how to apply. And creating your account, a little bit more information about what exactly you're going to need. Um, it does ask you, uh, it, you have to agree to, some, to a privacy statement. There's an email communications agreement. Um, what else? Next slide. Yes, and your profile. There are a couple of things there that you have to include for your personal information and your address. Uh, authorized users would be a question about who else would have access. So are you, is it just gonna be you or are you giving your parent or a guardian or a family member access as well to be able to actually go in and see your, your profile? Um, yep, and there is, yep, thank you. And then yes, exactly, we can, you can also apply directly from your phone. Um, there is an app there. You can find it in the app store and on Google Play. And after you apply, so you've already submitted your application, what happens next? So don't worry about the send your transcripts because you are current students, so we are going to be sending your marks for you. But please, again, verify your grades, make sure everything is correct. Update your application if anything, if you do need to change anything. If you need to add or remove a program, now with OCAS, with Ontario Colleges, you can only apply to up to five programs, but you can still make a change. If you would like to remove one thing and add something else, as long as there is still space available in that program, you can do that. Please also make sure to confirm your offer. So colleges begin sending out offers on February 1st. Um, and then finally, applying for financial aid, and we're, we'll be talking about that a little bit more and more information coming in the future about that. But once you've confirmed your offer, then it's time to start thinking about that. Keeping your account updated again, um, remembering to log out if you've gone in uh, and save any changes, although you can stop at any time. You don't have to apply all in one sitting. You can work on it a little bit. You can save, log out, and then resume working on it um, in the future. Uh, and finally, information on how to view and confirm your offers. This is step by step. If you want to check uh, what offers you have, um, when you want to change an offer or make it, like, change an accepted offer, this is the slide that you will check. Um, and I think, yep, next slide. I think this is it for that. And then uh, back to Ms. Orr. I think. All right. So now how do you pay for everything, right? So for some of you, uh, I know paying for tuition, for supplies, for books, for even residency is a concern and a question. So one area is to uh, start with OSAP. So that's the Ontario Student Assistance Program. It is a government uh, program that offers financial aid for students for both college and university. What's really important is a lot of people are like, I don't want a student loan. But OSAP isn't just about student loans. So first and foremost, every single person who applies for OSAP is first considered for a grant. 
a grant is something you do not have to pay back. So when you put in all of your financial situation and all of your finances, all of your history, where you're going, all of your programming, they are automatically going to um, consider you for a grant. And then if they're like, OK, you don't meet the criteria of a grant, but we can give you a student loan at this rate with this payback timeline because it doesn't just start right away. It's not like, hey, you graduated. Now you pay us back all this money at once. You can actually set it up with them so that sometimes that payback value starts a year after you graduate or two years after you graduate. Um, so all of the OSAP can pay for tuition, books, equipment, uh, fees charged for your school, uh, living expenses, childcare, all that stuff. And so make sure please that you're checking out OSAP. The other options that you have are, uh, so banks have great programs for students as well who are going to school. Um, again, the great thing about banks is you would do something like a student loan line of credit. And for that, you would actually, <coughs> sorry, um, you would only have to pay that back again a year, two years, three years after you have graduated when you have actually started working. So each of these, <coughs> my apologies, sorry. Each of these uh, links on here have different scholarships, information, bursaries, um, available to students who are seeking financial support for college. As always, if you need help, you can uh, contact Ontario Colleges, you can contact your guidance counselor. We are here to help you through this whole process. And with that, we are now at questions. <coughs> well, we did have a question about when uh, marks are going to be sent to colleges and universities. Um, so colleges and universities are going to receive your end of semester one marks. They're also going to receive your midterm semester two marks. Um, and then they do end up getting updated again at the very end of the year, uh, because when you do get an offer, it is a conditional offer, assuming that you're going to finish the year, you're going to graduate, you're going to um, have the, the required marks to get into your program. So they do get updated again at the very end of the year. And another question we had, um, great questions, everybody. Thank you. A question re related to the difference between universities and colleges um, and the feeling that sometimes universities have a certain reputation um, and what would be, you know, is there an advantage to university instead of college? So that is uh, that is a, an important question. Uh, and it's important to know now what type of career pathway you're thinking of. Um, uh, as Ms. Orr was saying before, there there is quite a variety of programs available at colleges. So a lot of people were familiar with certificate programs or diploma, but a lot of colleges are offering degree programs as well. So depending on what your chosen career pathway is and whether that pathway requires a degree program, which is usually a four year program, um, some careers are going to require a college diploma. Some people go to university and get a four year degree program and then still have to go to college and then get an additional certificate program uh, to help them with their job or to move forward in their career. Uh, so that is it really I think is going to depend on what you know where what your pathway is and, and it is worth exploring if you're thinking about possibly college and university for a degree program. Uh, it's good to take a look at what are the, the required marks? What are the uh, required courses? Um, do you have an, an equal chance at getting into both? Uh, see what they have to offer. Sometimes differences in, in terms of things like class sizes or um, opportunities to have labs or hands on um, hands on work. Uh, they, they are sometimes quite unique in the, in the different programs between um, between different institutions. And any more questions? There was a question for about OSAP, um, Ms. Orr, if you could answer this. Um, are you only able to apply to OSAP once you've submitted your application or once you've been accepted to a school? Or can you basically apply for OSAP now? Uh, so I would recommend applying and then uh, filling out your applications for OSAP just because you're going to have a little bit more information. You do not have to wait until you've been accepted into a program uh, because once you start the application process, it does it's not an instantaneous thing. So it's going to be a little bit more of a back and forth and then there will be an opportunity with OSAP to uh, come back 
and add the information for the program that you have accepted. Uh, we are going to do a full workshop on how to finance post-secondary uh, with um, uh, one of the financiers from both a college and university institution. And that night's gonna be a little bit later in the year, uh, possibly even closer to January, February. And again, once we have that all set up, then uh, we'll, we'll send that information out to you. Another question, Ms. Orr, do colleges have early acceptance like universities? <clears throat> so universities don't really have early acceptance either. Um, it's just you apply early, you are given conditional acceptance early. Uh, so our, both universities and colleges um, are kind of the same in that respect. In terms of college, it has a rolling enrollment. So as long as you apply before February 1st, you're good. OK, you're part of that equal consideration. So if you apply tomorrow, you could receive um, an offer within the first week of November. The, the earliest you can accept, you will be given a conditional offer would be November 1st. So you apply early, you're accepted early. It doesn't make it early acceptance. <laughs> uh, same thing with universities, right? So if you go through um, OUAC and you do your application early and you have a university who is doing rolling acceptances, then you could be given an offer early. But again, that's not the old definition of early acceptance. <clears throat> and just to clarify, um, I wanted to ask how many universities and colleges can I apply to and how many programs can I apply to within one university or college? So we'll get to the university uh, part of that question shortly. Um, but in terms of colleges, oh, I'm going to go back to my notes just to double check. So I don't give you the wrong information. Um, and maybe yeah, it's, 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 five. it's five. That's um, what I thought. OK, and yeah. five and three per campus. Yes. Yeah. So you can do so you could do two campuses, potentially three at one campus, two at another. But you can't do one campus with five programs. That's right. Um, a student has also asked about what happens if they are missing a, a course, and I, I guess that means if they're almost graduated and they realize they're short of course, you can definitely meet with your guidance counselor to figure out some options, and that could include things like night school or a dual credit course or an e-learning course or maybe just adding something in day school if possible. Um, sometimes students will finish in June and they might still be missing a course if you can't fit everything in. Um, and for some students, that means finishing up their 30th credit in, in summer school in July. Depending on if your program is able to wait, there are some programs if they're not full and the student has applied and received an offer, but then they still are missing that one credit. It's important to communicate with the college and let them know you still would really like that offer. You still are hoping to keep that offer and you're, you're willing to go to summer school and hopefully the program will still be open and they'll be able to wait for you to complete that 30th credit if that's if that's the situation. But for, for more specific information uh, on your, uh, your particular question, you can also connect with your guidance counselor. And the student has also asked a question about the three categories that are required for graduation um, as part of the requirements from Ms. Orr's slide at the beginning. So the idea of those is in addition to the, the other requirements like the core subjects like English and math and science, uh, the idea is that students uh, take a variety of courses and not just take only courses in a certain discipline. So uh, the three different categories include things like one course from a social science or Canadian and world studies or French or co-op or guidance course. Um, another one will, will be one course from either a science course or French or phys ed uh, or business. So there are, um, we can look at your specific question and just to make sure you're not missing anything, but basically they, there is a variety and the idea is that you throughout your four years, you've taken at least one thing in a couple of different disciplines. Oh, and also a question about what if we get accepted into a school that's far away? Um, then what happens? That's a great question. And hopefully you would be prepared knowing uh, whether you'd be willing to move far away, because if it's far away, then you're probably going to have to commute if it's not a school that you can get to uh, in a good amount of time by, by staying at home. So you're going to be looking at options for different residents and see, you know, what does the college offer? Does the college offer something that will work for you that you'll have to live there? 
or are you going to be looking for a space to to rent um, in, or to buy or whatever your situation is in the community? Um, so that's going to definitely impact your what you have to budget for. So if you are somebody that's going to be looking at OSAP, that's something important to to factor in because you're going to be needing more funds if you're also going to be paying for housing, for paying for your residence when you're out there. Oh, another good question. And you know what? One that's on uh, a lot of people's minds. Like what happens if you don't get accepted? If you uh, apply and maybe you've even applied to five things and then you don't get an offer. Uh, excellent question, and it does happen. So please don't stress about that because there are a number of things. It's never, you know, hopeless. There's always something. So one possibility is going back and taking a look to see what programs still have space. And again, uh, I think we mentioned with college, with college, they do have a, a rolling acceptance, like it's, with the exception of the highly competitive programs. You might be able to get accepted even a lot later. Later, you might apply. You might contact the colleges and see what else might still have space. So um, especially if you find that you were headed for one top choice and you don't think you're going to be able to make it because maybe you weren't able to complete that credit or get the mark that you needed, uh, they're very good at communicating with you and, and helping provide some options. Sometimes it might just mean that you might have to go back and upgrade a course. So let's say you had a lower mark in one subject and you really needed to have a certain mark and now you don't have that mark which means you didn't get accepted. So again, we could look at options, maybe a night school course. Maybe if you know you're struggling and you think, you know what, this is not looking like I'm going to end with a, a mark that I'm happy with, we might suggest night school or even summer school um, or, or something like that to be able to upgrade your mark. So depending on why you didn't get in, we'd have to look at, is it just one course? Do you need a bit more time? Um, do you need to maybe rethink some of the programs that you were applying for? Maybe you needed more of a strong foundation in some of them. Uh, so we're definitely here to work with you if that happens. If you start to worry about that and you notice early on that you're starting to be worried that that might happen, definitely reach out to your guidance counselor and we will work with you to figure out what is, um, you know, we want you to aim high. We also want you to be really realistic and have a couple of options so that you do know uh, that you have options basically. And um, yeah, we're here to support you. And can you apply to both universities and colleges? Sure, you are encouraged to. So uh, there are different application formats, which if you're if you're going to be with us in the second half of the presentation for university, you'll see uh, the difference. But definitely um, through OntarioColleges.ca, you're welcome to apply for college. And then through uh, OUAC, you can apply for university. So, um, you know, as long as you're paid to pay for those two application fees, uh, you yeah, definitely you can apply to both. Uh, so, OK. Oh, yeah, my chats are back now. Uh, so another question is if I apply to, uh, I'll generalize it a little bit, uh, a program at both the university and college level, which program has an advantage in getting a job? Um, so we have to kind of really look at the program on a specific level and what each one has um, available to students. So I say that using an example. So if you're in a university program that has a co-op option tied to the program, then that would be a great program. Same thing because college already really does come with that co-op or placement option tied to many of those programs. So it's a case by case basis. So I don't want to say, oh, well, one is definitely going to be better than the other because uh, one, it's about you as a person, as an individual, as a learner. Uh, it's about the campus. It's about the technology. It's about the resources that that program that college or university has. Uh, so but your guidance counselors, we can meet with you. We can review both of those programs um, and do a pro con list. And I, I know I speak for the other guidance counselors where we've had to do many of those uh, for students. So we're happy to to help come up with that. But there's no one answer for that uh, unilaterally. So um, OK, so we are at 645. And so to respect everyone's time, uh, we are going to move on to the university portion of this uh, this evening. Uh, so again, if you still had questions and we didn't get to those questions, I do apologize. Uh, we will have another Q&A period at uh, 715 ish. 
Um, but there is a Google form that's going to go up in the chat and you can submit your questions then um, and a guidance counselor will reach out with you to you specifically. Uh, so first I would like to introduce Mr. Omazia, who is our acting principal, who would like to welcome everybody. Thank you and Thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here tonight. We now have over 200 participants, which is amazing. It's awesome to see all of our parents and students uh, supporting this workshop, but also coming out and uh, getting information that's so necessary as you plan your post-secondary career. It is never too early to, path to plan that career, uh, that pathway, sorry. And I hope that you do take advantage of the Q&A in this presentation. And to remember that guidance counselors are here throughout the year to support all of you. So if you have any questions that are not answered or something occurs to you later on, please reach out to the school and ensure that you get the support that you need throughout this whole process. Um, and if the, if the admin can be of any support to you, please for sure reach out to us as well. And I'm going to hand it back over to the team to take you through the presentation tonight. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And next up we have Ms. Effie Lagoudis, who is one of our guidance counselors, uh, E through M, and uh, she's going to be monitoring our chat so she can uh, say hi. Hi everybody, or hi again if you've been with us since uh, for the last 45 minutes. It's really great to be here with you and uh, welcome. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Perfect, thank you. And then I am uh, Ms. Orr. I am the Head of Student Services and Pathway Planning here at the Woodland School. Uh, so we're gonna be moving through this presentation. Uh, so going through university applications from 6.45 to 7.15. Again, I say ish. Um, and then we are gonna move into questions. For those of you who are joining us, yes, this presentation is being recorded. Yes, we will post it to the Student Services site as well as the uh, Grad Google Classroom. Uh, we will also make this presentation available to students so that they have access to the links within it and the videos within it. And if you are hearing grumbling in the background, it is my rather noisy dog at the moment. So uh, first and foremost, let's start with your graduation requirements. So again, those of us, those of you who have been with us since the beginning, uh, you will have heard this already, but those of you who have joined us, um, this is really important. So bear with me. So you're going to want to make sure that you have your 30 credits for graduation by the end of June. So that means 18 compulsory credits and 12 optional credits. So you are going to want to make sure that you are completing your three additional categories. If you are not sure, please contact your guidance counselor and they will help walk you through that to make sure. Those additional categories, uh, make sure that you are a well-rounded graduate who has explored multiple uh, subject areas. So there's stuff in there for either guidance or co-op, senior social science, science, math, phys ed. Um, so just again, so some students stick really close to just math and science and they never explore any of the more humanities based courses. These make sure that they are a bit more well-rounded and same thing goes for students who are like, I will only take arts and humanities, uh, it still makes sure that, again, you've got a co-op option or a tech option or something like that in there. SHM, SHSM requirements, uh, please make sure you're checking in with your team lead um, to make sure that that teacher has loaded all of your requirements in there so that all of those components have been met by June. When you are looking at your um, uh, OUAC application, uh, when you've logged in and made your account, you may see that the SHSM requirements have not yet been met. They will be by the end of the school year, as long as your teacher lead has entered all of those informations. Unfortunately, your guidance counselor cannot help with SHSM. That has to be your teacher lead. So please make sure that you're communicating with them and you're making sure that everything is sorted for that. OSSLT, um, I'm confirming with all of you here and now, you do not have to do it. Uh, you do not need to take the course. You do not need to take the test. You're free. However, you do have to submit your volunteer hours. You've got to submit 20. Um, and again, these links here are for resources on the student services site. You do not have to submit your community hours in order to submit your application to university or college. So please don't wait until that gets loaded because to be honest, if you've not finished them yet, if you've not loaded them yet, um, it's an ongoing process. Those volunteer hours simply have to be uh, on record by the end of June. So please make sure you're doing that. On that note, guidance counselors have to adhere to really strict criteria for your community service hours. So 
all volunteering is great, but not all volunteering is community service. And so we really want to make sure that you are meeting that criteria. And when in doubt, uh, please make sure that you are contacting your guidance counselor because no one wants to do 200 hours of volunteering just to be told it's great volunteering and it's great experience, but it doesn't qualify as community service. Nobody wants to have that conversation. And unfortunately, we have to have that conversation more than we're comfortable with. So you want to aim for things that are support not-for-profit agencies. And again, that would be key events that you're doing on um, day the day of, not necessarily the planning of said events. Uh, you're going to look at uh, structured programs to promote tutoring, mentoring, visiting, and coaching. So tutoring and mentoring, if you're looking for something in school, then you've got stuff here um, uh, out of student services that you can volunteer. Visiting would be something similar to if you were going to a community center, a church, a religious organization, cultural event, um, old age home, hospital, um, and you're sitting with either youth or elderly, keeping them company, reading to them, playing board games. It's visiting, right? But it's still community service because you are connecting to the community. And then, of course, coaching. Now, coaching is really tricky because if you go over to the ineligible side, you'll also see coaching is there. Um, and so what's really important is that you are keeping in mind, is it for profit? And is it subsidized? So that's where you're going to want to make sure. We're going to get into that for in a second. Look for things that are promoting uh, environmental awareness or contributes to the health and well-being of any group. Uh, anything that is a club or religious organization, arts, cultural association, or even political organization, uh, all of those count. So Celebration Square always posts um, some really cool events that you can volunteer for. Those are great. And again, when in doubt, contact your guidance counselor. Flipping over to the ineligible. So these are things that your guidance counselor is going to be like, yeah, this is great opportunity for volunteering and leadership. And you can definitely pull on this experience in your interviews and on your resumes and on your letters, but it is not community service. So student activities that displace paid workers or work that you should be paid for. So if there are anybody in that organization that either is getting paid or used to be getting paid for the work that you were doing, that does not qualify. If you are doing work at a camp or you're an instructor or you're assisting at an organization where stuff is not subsidized, that also does not count. What does that mean? So there are a lot of camps and organizations that rely on student and uh, community volunteers for community service. They rely on that because they subsidize the pricing of participation for youth. So if you're doing something that's like a city run camp, there's subsidized pricing for that. If you're going through a religious organization, there's subsidized pricing for those participations. But if you're going to something that, you know, we're going into winter, if it's a ski hill or a ski rink or a skating rink, um, a dance studio, those are all for profit and none of that work is subsidized. So that's not gonna count. Anything that's take your kid to work, um, anything that you hold a um, executive position for, even if it's a not-for-profit, it's still not going to count. And I'm going to explain that too. So it basically means, let's say you are the treasurer of a not-for-profit organization. Okay, and you attend weekly meetings, you help organize events because you're keeping track of the, the finances for it, um, and you run charity, paperwork, organization, administration stuff. None of that counts. Okay, that is a position and a mantle that you took on, and it doesn't qualify. What will qualify, even as you're in that, that role, let's say on the day of. So as part of your executive, you have helped plan an organization. On the day of, when you are actually helping with that event, those hours count, okay? So really make sure that you're checking with your guidance counselor because nobody wants to get, as I said, 200 hours into it and then realize your hours don't count. For this year, um, and as with last year, what is accepted is 10 hours for paid um, work. So let's say you have a part-time job, contact your guidance counselor and say, hey, I work at Tim Hortons. How do I get 10 hours? Because you can claim up to 10 hours. We're gonna send you reflection questions. You fill out the reflection questions. You let us know what responsibilities you have as an employee, and then you get your 10 hours. Same thing goes for family responsibilities, okay? You can um, claim up to 10 hours for those family responsibilities. So maybe you help your, your younger sibling with homework. Maybe you help clean the house on weekends. 
all of that counts. So there's your 20 hours right there if you're really struggling for what this criteria really calls for. Uh, court ordered community programs do not count. Any activity that provides financial revenue for your organization does not count. Um, and then of course, anything that does not comply with the policies of the ministry, the appeal board or human rights legislation. I'll say it again, when in doubt, contact your guidance counselor before you volunteer. As, as I said, all volunteer is great experience, but not all of volunteering is community service. Some examples, so volunteering at a food bank is great. Being a camp leader at a not-for-profit camp that offers subsidized pricing is fantastic. Assisting with school events and charities is great. Um, joining a peer mentoring program is fantastic. Assisting with animal shelters or food banks, retirement homes, long-term care, that's all fantastic. Things you want to avoid, as I said, those leadership positions in clubs or organizations, any volunteering for a company or organization where you assist with administrative tasks. Again, administrative tasks, either someone should be getting paid for it or you should be getting paid for it. Um, so again, even if it's, um, you know, there are some circumstances where it may work, but they're few and far between and you're going to want to talk to your guidance counselor. Volunteering as an instructor as like a dance studio, ski club, where membership is not subsidized, those are not going to count. Um, and same thing for tutoring centers. Yes, mentor tutoring programs in the school, in the community, at a shelter, at a YMCA, at the library, they do tutoring programs as well. Those are all great and they qualify. Anything that like Spirit Math, Oxford, Sylvan, Kumon, none of that is going to qualify, okay? There are paid people in there doing the job that you are also volunteering and doing. So either A, I would contact them and be like, uh, can I get paid? Or you are now doing the job of someone that someone could be getting paid to do, okay? Uh, so now we're actually going to move on to uh, what you're all really kind of here for, and that is the applying to Ontario universities. So first and foremost is research, research, research. Uh, normally you would be able to go and walk and see all the vendors and, uh, you know, talk to all of the universities and get some of their fun swag that they always have. But thank you, COVID. It is not this year. So they have, again, done some virtual events. Uh, the next one is Tuesday, October 26th from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, so there's additional uh, sessions that are going to, to pop up as well, but this is the next one. Um, and there'll be six 30-minute sessions where you can pop in and see uh, different universities, hear their presentations, ask your questions, and make a contact uh, with those recruiting officers. So I've put the link there. Again, when you download the um, presentation, you can click on it or you can just simply uh, Google Ontario University Fairs and you'll get all that information. Then, so you are all going to be using the OUAC um, uh, portal to actually starting your application process. So you want to do your research, as I've said, and you can start that research either at OUAC or Ontario University Info. And so there's two places there. They both work together. Um, I like starting with uh, OU Info uh, simply because if you're not really sure what program you want yet or you're not really sure what campus you want yet, it's a great resource because it has everything in one stop. So it has your programs, it has your universities, it has your finances, and it helps you manage the step-by-step -step criteria for those applications. So it's a great place to start when you're doing your research. All of you have been emailed a OUAC access code. If you are in grade 11 and you are watching this presentation, please do not create an account. If you have already created an account, then you are going to have to create a new one next year with a different email, okay? So you can just delete the pin, forget about it. You'll be sent a new pin next year when you're ready to graduate. Um, so that's my disclaimer to the grade 11s watching this. Please do not make an account. Please do not submit an application. Uh, you're not ready to graduate. You are not ready to apply. You will do that next year. Okay, but you can start your research. Your PIN is confidential and it is linked to you. Don't share it, don't lose it. Um, make sure you're taking care of it because it is linked to all of your academic information. So your volunteer hours, your SHSM, your grades, your applications, everything is linked to it. 
So uh, within that, you would have your temporary pin, your school number. Um, so that is our school MIDENT number, and then your student number, which you will notice has like a bunch of zeros in front of it. I think it's six zeros, and then that's your uh, student number. So that's your OUAC number. You're going to research your university options, like I said. So you can do um, the e-info, the OU-info, uh, OUAC website. These are all great resources to help narrow down what programs you're looking at, what universities you're looking at, what campus you're looking at, because some universities have multiple campuses. Um, you're also going to want to pay attention to um, different programs, what they each offer, if there's doing virtual tours. Um, and just because you can't book an in-person tour, doesn't mean that you can't simply go to the campus, walk around and see if you have a connection. I'm a really big believer that you need to feel connected to that campus. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then you're gonna wanna write down your program choices, your codes and keep them handy for your actual application time. So mark your calendar. These are the big dates. Uh, so October and November is when you get your access codes um, and you've done your research, okay? So right now it's research time. Get your programs, get your codes, start doing your applications, getting all of your ducks in a row. Because by January 13th, you need to have submitted and paid for your application. Please do not wait until the 13th. Don't even wait until the 12th. Don't wait till the 11th. Submit it early. Inevitably, it is a very busy time and OUAC does their absolute best. But if you bump into a problem, it is going to take them a while to be able to get back to you. So please, 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 please do not wait until January 13th to submit your applications. May 27th is the latest date you can expect a response to your application. So what happens between you know, now and May 27th? Well, that's when you are applying. So you will have applied by January 13th and universities start looking at your application. Okay, so let's say you're going to apply November 10th. Okay, great. So you've applied, you've submitted, you've paid, okay? Because your application is not really submitted until you've paid. So they, if the university itself has larger programs, then they may start doing what's called rolling offers. And so they're all conditional offers. So if you apply in November 10th, you may receive a conditional offer from them by the end of November or whenever it is that they're sending those offers out. That's not early consideration. <laughs> it's just you applied early, they've looked at you early, they're doing a conditional offer early. The only school that really has early offer is the Q Arms at Queens, okay? And that's really the only deadline. Um, and it's more about their scholarship than about anything, but you can't apply to their scholarship unless you've applied to their program. So keep that in mind. So by May 27th, you will have received an offer um, and then you have until June 1st to accept that offer. What's really important about that timeline is let's say you receive three or four offers. You're only going to accept one. So what happens after June 1st? So you accept your one offer and then those universities go, OK, we sent out, you know, 800 offers for a program that accepts 600 people, but we still have, you know, 200 spots that we can fill. Then they do a last round after June 1st of acceptances. And those are people who are maybe waitlisted or were just on the cusp of making um, the application deadline or um, criteria. And so then they'll still offer it at that time. So again, uh, and I say this because we had the question earlier for, for colleges, if you don't receive an offer by May 27th, it's not all lost. You can apply for programs that still have room and you can still receive offers after that June 1st deadline because those programs are gonna wanna fill their seats. So undergrad 101 is where all of you should be um, applying unless you're international. So when you click on that, it's going to say answer your questions and then you'll say, OK, I'm here. I'm a citizen. I'm a resident. Answer those questions and then it's going to kick you over to the appropriate um, application. Apply now. And then you put your username, your password, and then you're going to do your create your profile. OK, so this is more of a step by step guide. I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker because you'll have this presentation later. Um, and OUAC really does have a great step by step tool that helps you. They do the arrows and the pointing and it is a really simple step by step procedure. So you're going to fill out all of your personal information um, and username. You're going to create your password. Please do not forget your password, please. <laughs> so create a username that you are going to remember. 
that is your name of some variety. Um, use an email address that is appropriate and something, again, that you have regular access to. Uh, and please use a password that you are going to remember. And then write all of this down and put it on post-it note and stick it on your computer, take a picture of it, put it in your phone, give it to a parent and be like, don't lose this. And they, those are your three backups to not lose this because if you have to reset stuff, again, if you're waiting until closer to the deadline, nobody wants it to be January 13th, you're ready to hit submit and pay and now you can't remember what your password is. Nobody wants that. So then you're gonna put in your school number, the student number and the temporary pin, which you have been sent. Uh, you're going to put all the information in to create your account. There's help buttons along the whole way. So if you get stuck, you can one, contact your guidance counselor because sometimes it's a really simple answer. But if you really get stumped, then you can uh, hit the help button there. And OUAC is really great at helping, but again, you've got to give them time. Uh, add your personal and contact information. And then you're going to start looking at programs, which is really what is the important criteria here. So if you already know from your research what the program code was, you're going to type that in. If you're still not 100% sure, then you can start looking through universities, geographic area or uh, program. You can visit the websites. Uh, some of you, if you've sat in our offices lately, I have even for some of you been like, okay, let's actually go through this and I can show you what it is that each of these programs visits uh, websites look like so that you can see what the requirements are for application. Ranking. Okay, here's what so many of you have questions about and what you want to know. So yes, ranking matters if it is within the same university. Now, some universities say they don't care about ranking. Well, fair enough. Um, I have loaded up a resource for you that actually just got published today. I put it in the grad Google Classroom, um, and it's a really quick guide to see, you know, um, how they feel about ranking uh, in terms of universities versus programs, um, as well as some other criteria in there that you may want to take a look at. So. There are schools, which I like to say have bigger egos, uh, who may actually really want to see that they are your first pick, okay? Um, so schools like uh, Waterloo, if you're wanting to go to Waterloo, then rank them first. If you're doing three programs within Waterloo, then your ranking matters even more because you want your first choice, second choice, third choice in that order for the school. So let's say you're doing the three programs at University of Guelph, fantastic, but you want, uh, you know, um, art, your art program first, literature second, and then journalism third, okay? But if you really want that journalism, don't put it third, put it first, okay? Because a university is going to look at your applications within that ranking order. So please make sure that, you know, the ranking of universities cares less and less and now um, as we've moved through over the last five or six years, but within a program, ranking matters sorry within a university ranking matters so if you are applying to more than one program at a university please make sure you are very clear about how you are ranking that program within that university um fees uh, you know you don't get anywhere without paying for for your applications so for college it was 95 dollars. for university it is 150 with that it's three program choices um, and this is your base required fee. You do not uh, get this money back. Uh, so please make sure uh, that you are paying close attention to your timelines because your, your application is not submitted until you have paid. Let's say you wanna do more than three programs. It's $50 in addition to that 150 for every additional choice. Same thing goes if you make changes that's another fee, okay? So you, until you submit, you can make as many choices and changes and switcheroos that you want. There's no, there's no fee for that. If you submit your application in November and you decide that you wanna add more programs, you can, it's an extra 50 bucks, okay? So please make sure that you are, you know, as much as we always say, you wanna make sure that you have, you know, your first choice and your second choice and your third choice all lined up. 
you really do want to make sure that you're not applying to everything and anything because it's a lot of money. So please make sure that you're taking that into consideration. Some universities are also going to have what's called a supplemental program fee. Uh, so if there's a supplemental application or um, some additional testing that may happen, then that's going to be an additional fee and that'll come uh, a little bit later. Um, so you answer your questions. This is more about demographics uh, than anything else. So yes, you do have to answer some of these questions. Well, you have to answer all the questions, but uh, some of these are more about getting to know you and some of them are about getting to know the demographic of, of that application. Uh, this screen here, once you get to it, is read only. If you see that anything to do with your grades is wrong, please contact your guidance counselor and we will go in and correct that. It is actually the only thing that guidance counselors can help with when it comes to your OUAC application. Guidance counselors can go in and correct grades. That's it. OK, so please make sure you're paying attention to that. Go through, I verify and agree, and then you're going to pay. Again, guys, you're going to save it once you've paid for your application. You are going to want to print screen that display. You are going to want to have an OUAC reference number. You are going to want to print that off, put it in a book, save the digital file. You're going to want to do that so many times um, because there is nothing worse than thinking that you've submitted your application and then realizing, no, I didn't because something went wrong. If you were not sent an OUAC reference number for your application, your application has not been properly submitted. So you're going to want to, this is other than ranking, this is the second most important step. So make sure that you've done that. So then you submitted, now what? So you're going to log into your application, verify all the details. So you didn't miss any steps, that your grades are correct, that your email is good, that your password is remembered. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you keep checking all of that information because as soon as you start, as soon as you submit, those universities are going to start contacting you with some follow-up stuff. So maybe they're gonna send you a supplemental application. Maybe they're gonna send you an interview time. Maybe they're going to send you instructions for follow-up uh, a course that they need you to take or a test that they need you to take. And so make sure that you are checking that often. I would even say put a calendar reminder in your phone to do it at least, at least once a week, um, hopefully more. So then, uh, here is a, a, a little story of why. No one wants to miss out on their offer because they did not check their email. And it happens more often than you all like to think because you've submitted, you were given an offer, you accepted your offer and you walked away and you didn't look at it again. They will still send you information all the way up until you walk into that campus in September or late August. And if you don't finish any of the information that they have sent you, they will revoke that offer. Okay, it has happened. I can't express it enough. I had a student even two years ago who was like, Miss, what do I do? I didn't know that they wanted me to go and do this test and now I don't have a spot at that program. And there's nothing that your guidance counselor can do to help. Um, you all really do have to work with the university at that point to try and figure it out. So please, please, please check your email. And then I'm passing it over to Ms. Lagudas for uh, OSAP. Thank you so much. So OSAP, Ontario Student Assistance Program, um, there is there are different types of funds available through OSAP. There are grants. Uh, those are funds that you don't have to pay back. There are loans, uh, which you would have to repay back eventually when you're done school. When you do apply for OSAP, uh, you are automatically considered for both. What type of things can OSAP help you with? Everything from tuition, books, equipment, uh, living expenses, childcare for full-time, part-time students that have children. So there is a link there. There is also more information gonna, gonna be coming from us to you in the future regarding OSAP. Um, and next slide. So different types of financial support. There is a lot of support available. We really encourage you to take advantage of all, like looking for all of the different places you can get some help with funding. We know how expensive it is for post-secondary. So, um, you know, government assistance, we just talked about OSAP. There's also private loans. There are a lot of private banks that do offer loans that you can look into. So definitely start doing your research. There's also uh, information here on scholarships. For example, Scholarships Canada, on the grad uh, Google Classroom, you will see scholarships be posted there as they come up. 
it is early on in the year. There have been a few posted, but they it is about to get a lot more busy with scholarships, especially in the new year. There are a lot that get posted, so we encourage you to check that out. Also check out Scholarships Canada, Scholar Tree. Um, on Ontario University's info, there's scholarship information there as well. And then same thing with Ontario Colleges. Um, and then finally, next slide. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so need assistance. Um, as I said, your guidance counselor really can only help you with your grades. So if something else in your OUAC account is wonkadoodle, you are going to need to contact OUAC right away. Um, this does not include SHSM. This does not include the OSSLT requirements. This does not include your volunteer hours. All of that stuff will be uploaded from the school. But let's say um, your OEN number is wrong or your um, account information is wrong, your address is wrong, your birthday is wrong, your name is wrong. All of that stuff has to go through OUAC. So please make sure that you are checking all of that information and submitting early so that you're getting uh, giving them as much time as possible to check it all out. So some things to consider, and uh, I always give this as one of my last cautionary tales for, for parents and for students. So you forget your password, username, etc. Like I said before, it needs to, you need to go to need assistance. Your, your guidance counselor, we can't help. Okay, I can't reset passwords. I can't reset usernames. Um, this is why it's so important that you don't forget those. Also, don't wait to apply. So like I said earlier, you don't need to wait to apply um, for your community hours to be uploaded or for your SHSM to be done. You don't need to wait to apply until, you know, the OSSLT is updated or anything like that. Please apply as soon as possible. Like as soon as you're ready, submit it so that you don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. You're good to go. Supplemental applications. Uh, so for some programs, they're mandatory. You have to do them. You don't have a choice. Other ones, they're recommended. Uh, and I strongly recommend that you do them. So OUAC tells the university who you are as a grade, as a statistic. Here is all of your data, but not so much as the person that you are. Uh, Supplemental applications and universities will all call them something different, but do them. They're a great way for the university and, and recruitment officers to get to know you. You can also reach out to recruiting officers and departments, um, attend events virtually so that they can start associating with you. And when they see your applications, sometimes it helps. You never know. Private schools. So myth and reality. So we always say be very cautious if and when you are taking a private school course. Um, these are, uh, these appear differently on your transcript. So know that, that when you're on your transcript or when you're looking at OUAC, if you've taken a private school course, it says it, okay? It comes up as a P and a university is going to know that you took a course in private school and they're going to ask you why. So programs that are in high demand that, um, you know, have really high requirements to get in there, they are going to evaluate a student who took all their courses within their home school higher than someone who took courses in private school. Okay, so if you are attending day school and you decide, you know what, I'm going to do my English class in private school, they're going to want to know why. This is not night school and that's not summer school. Those are different. So e-learning, night school, summer school, those are all still through the Peel District School Board or Dufferin Peel or Toronto District School Board. So you're fine. Though This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a private school credit that you have paid to take. Um, they are viewed differently within applications. So you are going to want to make sure that you know the program you're applying to and the university and their stance on private school credits. Some universities will even dock your private school final grade uh, up to 10% uh, to take care of any infl inflammation that would have um, would happen with that. So check your ego when you're applying to these programs. Um, and I, I say that because do you really want to go to that program? Do you really want to go to that campus? Or do you just really want to say that you got in? Uh, because it's a lot of work for you. And again, it's a spot that someone else who really does want to go to that program now has to wait until you say yay or nay uh, to that. So please make sure that you are uh, only applying to programs that you are actually legitimately ex interested in accepting. Again, because it's money too, right? It's $50 per, per choice. So 
keep that in mind. And then early acceptances. I touched upon this a little bit earlier. Um, there is no real early acceptance timeline. Q arms with Queens is really the only one that you need to be aware of because it is tied to a scholarship. All other ones carry the same deadline of January 13th as the final deadline. Yes, they may accept earlier, but they are not going to fill their program before January 13th. So even if a school starts to do that rolling enrollment that I talked about earlier, they're going to say, OK, um, let's start letting people in that really have already met our requirements, um, already have some of the key courses that we need. Uh, they have the average in the GPA. They sound good. Let's offer them a conditional acceptance. They're not going to fill that program until the May 27th deadline. Okay, there's always going to be room in that program. So there's no real legitimate um, early acceptance. So when students are like, well, I have to have this done for early acceptance, that really is more of an American thing um, rather than a, an Ontario um, deadline. So Ms. Lagudis is going to do the transfer credits. Hi, yes, just real quick. Uh, sometimes students ask what happens if they go to one institution and then they decide that they need to change programs. So uh, it is possible uh, between a lot of universities and colleges for you to be able to transfer credits you've earned at one school to another. So there is a link at the bottom there where you can look into this in case this applies to you. Uh, you may not know yet since you're not accepted yet. Um, there is also one more important link at the very bottom there that talks about uh, collaborative programs and a lot of times students ask if they can apply to both or if there are any programs that combine university and college and there are a number of, uh, of partnerships between colleges and universities. So if you click on that bottom link uh, called you'll see collaborative university college programs, you will see a number of, of partnerships and a lot of them will include two years at college followed by two years at university. Um, it will let you know whether you have to have um, you have to have uni university courses and whether you would have to apply through Ontario colleges or whether you would apply through OUAC. So we think it's worthwhile to check it out so you can know all your options. There are a lot out there that you may not have even heard of before. So uh, we encourage you to research that as well. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in applying to U.S. schools, I posted a couple weeks ago um, about the policy for the school with in, in regards to applying to U.S. schools. If you are applying to a United States school, international school, or any school outside of Ontario, you should have already identified yourself to your guidance counselor, um, as well as any teaching staff that are acting as recommenders. We always say that that's a six week deadline because there's always meetings back and forth. People have to do report cards, recommendation letters, um, surveys. There's a lot that goes into these. So please make sure that you have already contacted and that you are requesting assistance, okay? Um, with in regards to applications for Ontario schools, yes, we are uh, supporting you with that. We do sessions such as this. We're also going to do lunchtime sessions for drop in for students as we go through the application process for both college and university. Um, and we're going to do another one for grade 11 students for their course selection uh, that is tied into part of our roles and responsibilities as guidance counselors. Helping students with universities outside of Ontario is a uh, added task. OK, it's an added responsibility, one that we are happy to, add, to to help you with. But please just be kind, be courteous, be conscientious of time. Um, and please, please, please don't email someone a week before the deadline and say, you know, you shall, you must, you will. Uh, so assistance with your application and recommendations letter is a courtesy. Uh, so teaching staff, especially this year with the learning model, um, some teachers are really strapped for time, especially if it's during a week where they are teaching two classes. Please, again, be conscientious, be considerate, be kind when you're reaching out to them and you are asking for that help. So if you've not already done so, please identify yourself to your guidance counselor ASAP uh, so that we can get that sorted. Um, and then we can start that whole process. So prior to doing so, please keep the following tuition. How are you going to pay for going to a U.S. school? OK, you, uh, Ontario schools are already expensive enough. Uh, universities in America are 10 times more expensive. OK, uh, post-secondary education in the U.S. can be 100,000 plus easy for 
uh, your four years. So how are you going to pay for that? Okay. A lot of the Ontario and Canadian resources do not uh, qualify for American schools. So you really want to make sure that you're taking care of that program. What program considerations with each school? Uh, same with locations. Are you prepared to live that far away from home? Uh, are, have you prepared that for yourself? Have you prepared that for your family? Do you have resources uh, in place? And then ego. Again, I say this the same way that I said it before. Are you applying because you truly want to go to that program, can afford to go to that program, are prepared to go to that program, or do you really just want to see if you can get in? There are hours and hours of work that guidance counselors, teachers, not to mention you as students, put into these applications just to be able to be like, yeah, I got in. That was great. You know, that's not what this is about. So please really kind of check with yourself, check with your parents, check with your guidance counselor, and uh, we're happy to help and meet and discuss this with you. Um, now we are at the uh, portion of this presentation where we can take some questions. Um, I did see one right off that I want to make sure that I acknowledge really quickly. Um, so back at the, the dates for a university, uh, by June 1st, that's when you have to make your final decision. So let's say in May, there's a program that you really like and you're like, yep, okay, I'm going to accept that program. You still have until June 1st to accept a new program. So let's say your conditional acceptance rolled in for, um, you know, a, a computer science program. And you're like, yeah, okay, you know what? I'm going to take that. I don't have any other offers right now. So yes, accept. I'm going to do it. It's not locked in until June 1st. Okay, so then let's say your dream school offered you your program, then you can be like, never mind, and you can pick that as long as it's before June 1st. As of June 1st, your program is locked in. So you can change your mind as many times as you want up until June 1st. After the June 1st, nope. All right, other than that, the floor is open for questions. Thanks for covering that question, Ms. Orr. We had that question a lot. In fact, students asking if they can accept more than one offer. So uh, just to add on to what you just said for a few students who were saying, can we actually can we actually accept two? So you can't accept two at once, although if the situation happens where you do get an offer that you prefer, you'll have to um, you, you'll have to reverse it. Basically, you'll have to cancel one and then accept the other one, but you won't be able to actually accept two at, at once. Um, we had a couple of great questions. A few students asking about, oh, when when can you apply if if a lot of your requests, uh, sorry, required courses are in semester two? Um, I know sometimes students worry about that and they wonder if it makes a difference if their required courses are not scheduled until semester two. It, it definitely does not matter. You are encouraged to apply whenever you are ready to apply. Um, universities are going to see all of your planned courses and so they will consider the information that they do have uh, and then they will see that you they will eventually follow through and, and they do want to see how you end up doing in those because as we mentioned it's going to be a conditional offer uh, but it, it won't affect when you you don't have to wait until you're enrolled in those courses definitely you can apply anytime. Um, oh we had a question about a gap year uh, some students asking about it, what if I were to take a gap year if you know already that you're taking a gap year, then you would not apply yet. When you'll be out of school as a, as a, I guess, a grad, an adult student, the process would be a little bit different. It would be a slightly different application in that uh, you're no longer our student. So this high school would not be sending your information automatically. You would still have to have a few extra steps to uh, request your transcripts and get your marks sent over. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you are not sure if you're taking a gap year and you end up going through the process, getting an acceptance, and at that point you see you're going to have to take that gap year, at that point you can communicate with the university uh, to see if you are then going to just defer that or what. But if you know for sure you're not going, then you don't have to apply uh, now at this point. Uh, we had a few questions on supplemental applications and what type of information should be written in a supplemental. And, and I guess we probably want to say that this there isn't really a one like a one size fits all. Um, sometimes universities are just looking to get to know you and for you to be honest. And um, we, you know, sometimes some of them are a lot more open ended and others are a little bit more specific. So. Uh, we definitely, some students are asking if there is support available. You can definitely come to us with questions, although it's not really 
It's not really a clear answer. Everyone is encouraged to write about what's meaningful for them so that the university has an idea of uh, the whole person. So they see the marks and the information sent by the school, but then with the supplementary in information, they get to see the other side of you that they don't see just from the transcript. Um, OK, some students asking if some of the pretty competitive programs, for example, at Waterloo or at U of T, whether they uh, take it into consideration if major courses were taken in the summer. That's a great question. And again, we. Um, yeah, so I started to. So I've actually talked to Waterloo, <laughs> which is one of the schools I probably talk to the most, um, simply because sometimes they have some really specific ideas. Um, so Waterloo has been um, rather understanding about the pandemic year and realizing that uh, some schools have done online courses, some have done octomesters, some have done quadmesters, some have done fully online, some have done a hybrid of all of all of it. Um, they've also realized that course selection, course offerings and course availability hasn't been great. So what does all of that mean? It means that as long as you took a summer school course within the school board, um, or like a, a public school board, so again, not a private school, on the supplemental application that you will have for Waterloo, you will acknowledge that and you will say due to scheduling or due to um, Peel Online School or due to COVID, I took this course online. Um, and so again, that's you getting letting them know as a person that you've acknowledged it and you, you, you're saying why. Uh, what they don't want to see is that, let's say you did three years of math in person and you know that math is a required course for their Waterloo program. And so you took that course on, in summer school or night school. They're going to really want to know why. OK, so any kind of required course. Uh, be really cautious about taking it in night school or summer school. Uh, and if you do have no other option, uh, make sure that you are telling that to Waterloo in that supplemental application. And if it's a scheduling conflict or that the course wasn't offered at the school or we couldn't make it uh, with your timetable, guidance counselors can also provide a really quick, it's like a three line letter that, uh, that says as much and you can hand that in with your supplemental application. Thank you. And, and a question about applications outside of Ontario. Some students are thinking of applying to uh, a school in British Columbia or just a school outside of Ontario. Um, can they get guidance counselor help? Yes, definitely. We encourage you to check out what all the requirements are. If this is a school that is not going to be included in OUAC, um, a lot of times they will require a transcript and you can request one of those from the school. We can't send you one electronically directly, but you can request a copy from the school or uh, and then send it yourself, or if it has to come directly from the school, we can send it electronically uh, as part of your application. Um, and please make sure you check what's required. Again, if you need any kind of recommendation from the school that you are aware of the deadlines for that, and you can reach out and we can definitely support you. Um, so if you uh, there's a question here about volunteer hours. So again, remember those community service hours. You only need to do 20. Uh, if you have submitted to the Google form and it's not been updated yet, guidance counselors are working on it. Um, you know, me personally, I probably do, you know, maybe 10 or 15 submissions per week uh, just because there is, we do have to be able to contact to verify and it can be quite time consuming. So we are making our way through those. Uh, if you want to uh, confirm that your hours have been um, updated, uh, then please just contact your guidance counselor and uh, and we can give you a thumbs up uh, of whether or not those hours have been updated in your system. Same thing goes, uh, eventually my blueprint will be syncing to SIS. So my blueprint was normally a really great resource for students to be able to access their courses, their grades, and all of their um, uh, volunteer community service hours uh, verification. Uh, my blueprint hasn't been updating and I know LTSS was working on it. Uh, last I heard, they think they fixed the issue, so it may even be synced now. So make sure you're also checking that because you can see if your hours have been entered on there. Um, again, you only have to do 20. So 
Uh, make sure you're submitting those sooner rather than later. And all of that information is up on the student services site under volunteer and community service. Ms. Zora, there's a question here. Are supplementary applications due on January 13th? They are not. Uh, so what's going to end up happening is you are going to put in your application. You're going to submit. You're going to pay. It's going to be in. And then what universities are going to do is they're going to issue you a temporary student number. Um, and that's part of your application number. And that's when they're going to start emailing you. Uh, to say, OK, here's how you connect your supplemental application or here's the follow up questions. Here's your follow up courses. We noticed you didn't have this course on your timetable or we need you to do this test. They are going to communicate with you through either a the email address you provided with OUAC or they are going to issue you, uh, as I said, that temporary student number and an email account or portal for that school. So let's say McMaster uh, uses their own portal. So then they're going to give you login information and a temporary student number. You will log into that portal and they will send you information for there. So it, all of those things are, stu are, are things that students are responsible for checking up on. So please make sure that you're not missing any of that because that will be the difference between you getting an offer and losing an offer. And Ms. Lagudis, a question for you. Can you shed some light on scholarships and where and how can we apply? Sure, thank you. Um, I know we had a couple questions on scholarships and how students apply. And, and I think there's a distinction between the entrance scholarships. So for those, if you have grades over a certain percentage, a lot of the universities will automatically issue a, an entrance scholarship and that amount of money would just go higher depending on how high your average is. So for that, you, you would automatically be considered. Um, for scholarships, there, there's a lot of different things happening. There are a few large scholarships where we can nominate one student from our school. Um, when that happens, when we hear about a scholarship opportunity like that, I will post it in the uh, grad Google Classroom and I'll post some specific requirements. So for example, if it's something that only one student from the Woodlands can be recommended, uh, I will usually move up the, the application or nomination deadline and give you a couple of weeks, so give us a couple of weeks as a scholarship committee and uh, ask that you complete part of the application and submit it for consideration of nomination. And then the scholarship committee will meet uh, and select a one, uh, one person from the school who will be nominated. Now, th those are a little bit more rare. They're uh, for very large scholarships. There are a number of other scholarships uh, that come up during the year. There have only been a couple of the large ones so far, but a lot are coming up in the new year. Um, students are encouraged to check the guidance Google Classroom, check other scholarship websites such as Scholar Tree or Scholarships Canada. Please don't hesitate to apply. There's, there are a lot of funds that are there for so many different things. Not all scholarships are for students with the highest marks. There are a lot that are for academic excellence. There are some that are for uh, active community involvement. There are some depending on what background you are or what job your, your family or guardians might have. There are some for students that are focusing in a particular subject area for students interested in business or for musicians. There are a number of things, so we do encourage you to keep checking and definitely apply. Um, there are some of them will require a recommendation letters. So if you are planning to apply to something, then you have to ask someone at the school for a reference. Please, as Ms. Orr said, just give try to give as much notice as you can because the teachers would like to do a great job and write a great letter and it does take some time. So please don't hesitate to do that. Um, and yes, apply for as many things uh, as you can. And sometimes you might think, oh, I, I don't know if I'll get that one. And a lot of students have been surprised. A lot of people think that and sometimes all these funds get left and some scholarships go unclaimed. So we really hope that you take advantage of those opportunities and, and get those funds to help uh, pay for your school. Uh, there's a question here about US applications. Uh, so um, your transcript, your official transcript will have your course code, but uh, and then the title. So in terms of all schools within university or within Ontario, we all follow the Ontario curriculum. So those course codes remain the same um, and they're fairly similar throughout all of Canada. Uh, if you're applying to the states, those are different uh, for things like Common App or UC Berkeley has their own uh, application system. There is actually a place within there so that you can designate ENG for UO or for UE is, um, you know, 
um, university grade 12 English or enhanced grade 12 English. Um, if you're applying to U.S. schools and you have really specific questions about how you fill out that application, please just make an appointment with your guidance counselor um, because, uh, yes, the enhanced does count, uh, but you have to call it honors um, because that's how they recognize it or they recognize it as gifted, not enhanced. Enhanced is a Canadian term. Gifted uh, is an American term. So uh, you want to make sure that you're being really clear with that. Um, Ms. Orr, questions? There's a, yeah, there's Ms. Orr, there's a question um, that someone posted about marks uh, that universities will see. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're wondering about universities looking at final marks for semester one and midterm marks for semester two. Is that true? And are do universities look at grade 11 marks? OK, so on the resource that I posted today in the uh, Google Classroom, you'll be able to see what universities will take into consideration your grade 11 marks. And here's the only time that they do that. So let's say you're applying to a program um, and it's a medical program or it's a science program. And they very much have said in your top six, you must have English, which is for everybody, uh, biology, chemistry, and your two maths, right? So advanced functions and calcium vectors. Um, and then whatever other your six credit is. But let's say you don't have biology and calc and vectors until semester two. They may look at your grade 11 marks. Not necessarily that they will, but they may. So if your semester one midterm and your semester one final is still a little hazy, they'll look at that uh, grade 11 mark to see what is indicative of what you will accomplish within that class. OK, if that doesn't factor into your average. It's just simply a peak that they can look at to say, you know what? They got like an 88 or a 92 or a 74. And so we are going to base the conditional acceptance on that grade 11 grade. And then once you've got your grade 12 grades in, they'll firm that offer um, or say no. Um, in terms of the semester two final, yes, absolutely. So let's say you get your conditional offer. It's mid-May. You've locked it in on, on January 1st. You do not get to sit back and relax for the rest of June. Okay. Um, some students have tried and they have lost their offer come July. So yes, they absolutely look at that semester two final. So they're going to give you that conditional acceptance. All offers are conditional. So some will say it's a firm offer. It is absolutely. It's a firm offer. But if you coast, hmm, as we say, uh, for the rest of June and you your grades deteriorate, they will revoke that offer. So they absolutely look at your semester two final. Uh, and if you're taking any summer school courses, they, they look at those as well. So even summer school is not too late. If you realize that you're missing a credit for graduation, but you still want to apply, you can. You're just going to want to take a summer school course. And they will consider that because when you're in summer school, you're going to go to your, your teacher about midway through and say, I need to order a transcript. And on the very last day of school, a transcript will be sent to you. And then you have to send that to the university where your conditional acceptance is. Um, I think. Some of the questions in here are super specific. Um, so please make sure that you are filling out that Google form uh, with your question because uh, we are going to wrap things up. We're already about 15 minutes behind where we had sort of said we'll end the meeting. But I mean, there were good questions. So I'm really happy that we took the time um, to help you all with that. So please make sure that you're filling out that Google form if you have questions that we have not yet addressed and your guidance counselor will reach out to you over the next few days with answers to those questions. Uh, that form doesn't close. So, you know, once you start applying and you realize that you have questions in your application and you uh, have questions, you can either fill out that Google form or you can make an appointment with your guidance counselor or you can attend the weekly drop-in sessions that we are going to set up for November into December uh, to help you with that application process. So uh, without further ado, I, uh, on behalf of the guidance team, say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that it was beneficial. And if you have any questions, please submit it. 
And uh, we'll see you at the uh, application workshops. And we hope you have a great night.